Triumvirate Environmental. We, um, we currently are an environmental solutions and transportation company all throughout the East Coast and then recently now on the West Coast. Awesome, thank you. Welcome, and Matthew. Hi, um, so I'm Matt Flickel. I'm the Associate Director of the Amoebo Sciences Group here at Charles River Laboratories in Shrewsbury. And we focus on drug development, pharma, and with we've been doing it before, but certainly more germane in the last two years, uh, focusing on vaccine development, R&D, safety testing, including the COVID vaccines. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, so that it was honestly a perfect kind of segue into um, our next question. So uh, we will start, I guess, um, with you, Matthew, um, knowing a little bit more about um, your organization, can you share with us a little bit more about what you specifically do um, and the individuals that you work with in the organization? Sure. Um, so my team is about 80 people uh, currently, and what we focus on is novel drug and vaccine, drug discovery, development, and then safety testing. So all the preclinical work that goes prior to clinical trials in humans, which the one silver lining to the whole COVID thing is now everyone's really aware of drug development and the various steps along the way that they weren't two years ago. Um, so most of us are familiar with, you know, clinical trials in humans and all the rest. Um, we do all of the pre-work to make sure that basically the drug works, it doesn't have side effects, it doesn't have safety issues. And yeah, so career-wise, I've worked on things from HIV, which tells you how old I am, um, up to COVID. Awesome, thank you. Um, and just kind of a, a follow-up question. So you said there's about 80 people on your team. Are there major kind of like sets of roles people have projects or you know does it really run the gamut so basically we're split about half and half so half my team is made up of technicians and they're the ones actually performing the studies doing the research work you know following the protocols and what have you so they're the ones who actually do something useful and then there's about another half of us that falls into the support so either i have six supervisors work for me and another manager, as well as data reviewers, research associates, team leaders, and what have you. So half does the work and then half makes sure that we're making sure that they can do the work. Awesome. That is very helpful. Thank you for that. Gabriella, we will come to you next. So I'm um, sharing a little bit more about who your organization is and, you know, more details about what you do in your role. Yeah, so um, American Conservation Experience, ACE for short, um, is an organization that is really dedicated to providing access to education and training and, and careers inside of the conservation field. Um, we recognize that uh, everybody's path to conservation looks different. Um, and so what we've really been working to do uh, through my role um, and through other uh, new roles um, that are being established in ACE right now um, is really figuring out how we can provide the runway and create those pipelines to uh, provide more access, direct access to underrepresented communities um, and, and people to be uh, to join some of these conservation based jobs. Um, my background uh, is in conservation and, and music and law. Um, and I, my personal journey through all of that leading me to conservation was I was one of those underrepresented youths um, that was exposed to environmental science and conservation at a young age, but I didn't quite understand um, what the field of conservation was and how exactly I could play a role in that um, until starting out uh, my undergrad at Spelman College and really just learning more about the different facets of environmental science and the entire field of conservation and realizing um, from there through Vermont Law School that there are so many uh, opportunities for us to provide access to not only positions in conservation, but also to the educational uh, aspect of the entire field and really just, again, creating those opportunities and pipelines to get more diverse underrepresented communities involved um, in the field of conservation. And so that's what ACE that's what ACE has been working really hard to do. Uh, we partner with a lot of federal entities and community-based organizations um, to, to, uh, to reach those, those goals and those missions and 
you know, every, every day there's pivots and there's changes, but uh, along the way, we're just continuing to, to work hard towards that goal and would love to work with other people who are like-minded. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. And then Kevin going to bring that same question over to you. Of course. So um, in my specific role, I currently manage three employees. So I have a small little tight-knit group and then I'm a part of a 40 person branch in Connecticut. Um, as far as like a day-to-day operation stuff, I do, I have a lot of client meetings, um, we're a client-based company. So as our contracting work starts, ends throughout the day, uh, we have client meetings all day long. Um, I do a lot of compliance inspections. That's either EPA, OSHA, um, DOT, um, small little projects, maybe, uh, with, uh, specific researchers, um, sometimes, within um, those inspections come out little projects that we work with those groups with. Um, Lots of chemical management, inventorying. Um, Sometimes we have chemical consolidations at the end of the days. Um, And then safety planning. Um, That's really what the name of the game is for our company um, when it comes down to it. So that's where a little bit today we'll talk about um, how triumvirate is a little bit of an impact on that human health side, Um, especially, you know, with an environmental company, waste management services, that's, you know, that's the environmental side, but we do have a lot of impact on the health side and the safety side. Awesome. That is so helpful. Uh, and is another great um, segue into um, a follow-up question that I will ask all of you. Um, so One Health is a CDC-led initiative, um, for those of you who might not be aware. I mean, really, the goal is to focus on achieving optimal health outcomes by recognizing the interconnection between people, animals, plants, you know, and their shared environment. Um, and so, Kevin, we can absolutely start with you on this one, but can you talk a little bit about um, kind of how this notion, this kind of initiative ties into the work that you're doing? If there are, you know, areas like you were mentioning human health that you see um, your work touching upon as well. That'd be yeah, cool. um, it's definitely, it's, it's almost, um, it's almost so important. Sometimes it's not necessarily covered. So um, a lot of what Triumvirate does is we work with um, smaller universities, smaller pharmaceutical companies, um, some that do not have a fully built environmental health and safety department, um, whether it be a few facilities, you know, uh, managers or whatnot that that have that second hat. Um, but that's what we provide. And within within those operations, um, our employers employees are given the skills and the resources to help train um, and bring awareness to some of the safety concerns and hazards that smaller companies have where they do not have the resources. That's why they're contracting it out. So um, in order to, I would say, properly properly, um, work with safety storage, uh, the safe use of chemicals, uh, the safety of chemical handling, and then transportation. Um, So that's that's my... uh, Kind of segue into the health part. Um, are we going to stay with the health, or we want me to continue with the environmental health? No, oh, you can touch on as many okay. of them as, as okay. They, yeah. So um, within the environmental industry, um, the transportation of hazardous materials um, was definitely an issue, especially when all of these um, acts came about in the seventies, eighties, nineties. So that's what Triumvirate specializes. We have specific plans, programs in place that ensure that we can transport and have the correct permitting um, from state to state or through um, nationwide. We have facilities in Canada and Mexico that that travel in between the United States. So within that environmental health aspect, um, Triumvirate really focuses on our sustainability and our waste management impact because, you know, we can talk about different parts of pollution, but how Triumvirate sees it, waste management is is our realm. So we have facilities that uh, recycle materials, let's say biologically contaminated sharps, those are uh, incinerated and then recycled into plastic lumbers that are sold on uh, Home Depot and Lowe's. And Lowe's. Um, in our Canada facilities, we take um, solvents and different type of flammable materials, and we use those to treat other hazardous materials. So there's no real fuel being used other than the own waste. And then in our California branches, we use a similar process where we take 
um, flammable materials and solvents, and we return them to their elemental state or their, their virgin chemical state. And then we recycle those into paints and other thinners, um, just so the, the cost savings through that is huge. So um, those are our two big points that, um, that we're here to communicate with you guys and be on this panel. So um, any other questions on that, we can, we can touch upon it, but I'll send it to the next person. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and just a reminder for all of our students attending, um, if any of you have follow-up questions at any time, just drop those in to your Q&A box and I will make sure that they get answered. Um, so Matthew, we can bring this one over to you. So, um, you know, how does your work kind of touch upon One Health? So I'm going to try and keep it short, but this is one of those things that both by personality and frankly, the topic, like I, I fill the next 45 minutes, but that would be rude. But so I've been in the pharmaceutical development, like I said, since the HIV period. So I've been in it for 30 years and call it the holistic approach to it is something that has really developed over the last 10 years. And some of it is there's a recognition of the effects of you know underrepresented populations and all of these things that really have to be taken into account as well as the impact of the environment the impact of everything around us that has on health so it affects us in a whole host of different ways because we have to not only take those things into account which makes it sound like it's a bad thing but it's not because it enables us to target things to a patient much better. And if all you target is the patient and not the environment that they live in and the people that they live with, then none of this works as well anyways. So it's, it's made it vastly more complicated. It's made it a lot more interesting, um, but it's also what's enabled us to solve problems that we couldn't back in the time because I'm going to get on my little soapbox, but we were kind of arrogantly thinking we understood all the variables because everything we didn't incorporate, we decided wasn't valuable. And it's just not that simple and it's not that easy. Um, so, you know, it's funny, Kevin was talking about triumvirate and we used to contract to all of you when I was at Biogen and God knows we needed you all because we needed subject matter experts in these things. But so, you know, even at Charles River, we jump through a lot of extraneous hoops that frankly add to our bottom line, but, you know, minimizing our environmental footprint, minimizing the impact that we have on the people in the communities around us. Myself personally, I don't think you can have an attitude that's going to lead to good science if you don't kind of have that attitude of you have to care about these things. And as I said, what's been fascinating in our field is you actually have to think about those, whether it's designing clinical trials, whether it's testing your pharmaceutical medicines, will they actually work here? Will they work there? Will they work in different areas of the world, different cultures within the world? Like that stuff actually matters and has to be taken into account. So it's, like I said, it's made it vastly more difficult, but it's a heck of a lot more interesting and frankly, a lot more productive. So this stuff is important. Like it just is genuinely important. Awesome. Thank you for that. Gabriella, turning this one over to you. Um, you know, I, growing up, like being uh, involved in, in different, categories of well not categories but different fields of interest um i used to try to figure out what exactly is the the underlying foundation of each of these and how can we um how can i create a path of success for myself that encompasses all of these different fields that seemingly have nothing to do with each other and even within those individual fields how how can I figure out where I want to be and where I belong and still um, make all of those things uh, inter interconnect? Uh, for me, education has been the foundation of all of those things. Um, and I think that that's something that, that the education and training that uh, ACE is um, prides ourselves in, in doing. 
Um, Because, you know, it's easy to just, you know, connect anybody to a, a position or to a field of interest, but it's another to help to guide people and help people understand how all of these things are indeed interconnected with each other and how they directly um, support each other. Um, ACE has a lot of uh, internship programs with uh, with our federal very federal partners um, that actually I'm going to rephrase that. We have several different types of federal partners and within each of the federal partnerships that we have, we have several different diverse programs and, and internship positions that will allow our members to get a glimpse into each of these fields, um, whether that's working with public health, working with human, I mean, working with animals, working with plants, um, or dealing with environmental um, related things. One of, those, one of those great examples is we have a position um, that works with wildlife. Um, and just really working on habitat res restoration and making sure that we're taking care of the environment that the animals um, and plants that we need uh, for human life, you know, making sure that we're taking care of those habitats. Um, but then if you go to the other side of our of our programming, we have several different types of positions that will um, give students the entryway to learning about public health um, and learning about how those things are directly um, related to the environment and how we treat the environment. So I think that there's a lot of interconnectedness between all of those uh, um, subcategories, if you will, of public health slash conservation slash whatever. But even within that, I think that there's so much room to explore how we can use education as a tool to help people um, inside of the field and outside of these fields really learn you know, about all of the different pathways in, in ways that all of our different unique stories led us to where we are, but they're they're not mutually ex exclusive. They all definitely work hand in hand. And I think that um, ACE definitely provides those types of internship opportunities that are, are diverse, not just in the federal agencies that we partner with, but also in the types of positions within those federal agency partnerships that really just open up, again, open up the lens to education and training and experience that, um, that we we think it's important for for young people to to be a part of. You know, we're looking at our our future leaders, um, and in order for us to effectively train up our future leaders of conservation and public health, it starts with education and it starts with opportunities of experience. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go on my. I'm pretty passionate about this subject too, so I don't want to go on my soapbox, but uh, I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> no, all of those answers were so. Um, insightful and um, I think very valuable. So thank you all so much for those. Um, going to kind of scale it back one and, and go more individual um, for this next one. Um, but how do most people get into each of your fields? Um, and I realize most people is a generalization map is probably, you know, not even really answerable, but maybe each of you individually could, you know, that could be a good way to go about it. Um, and as a second question to that, um, what are the common entry level positions typically at your organization? Um, and Matthew, we can, we can kick this one off with you. Enough. Um, so it's kind of interesting because I'll use myself as an example. I had no planning whatsoever to get into the position that I started. It was literally, I was working in the dish room of the dining hall at the university I was at. And one of my friends who was scrubbing dishes next to me had a fiance who was in the position and I was needing to, you know, find a job when I got out of school and things just really worked out from there. And like I've told people, I happen to think this is true. I'm like, it's been the best job in the world. Right. And what that means for us is, you know, having a scientific background is helpful. It's certainly not essential. Some of the best um, technicians and even supervisors and actually even uh, the manager who works for me. Before they got into the field, they were bartenders, they were waiters, they were stocking shelves. Like what you need are people who are smart, want to learn because amazingly enough, all the stuff is that is currently in the books that people use you can read them even when you're not in school and you can learn those same things. And so, you know, amongst my team, like literally two of my technicians 
Americans. They were bartenders before they came here. You know, it's, there's a really varied background. It's just more, do you really want to learn? Do you have a desire to do something that has a real impact? And, you know, are you going to push yourself? Are you going to make sure that the quality of the work that we do is high enough to warrant, you know, the trust that's getting put in us? So that people come into it. I mean, the really flip answer, but it's kind of true is, they apply and they come out and they interview and they impress the people that they're with. You know, especially in the CRO world, when I was doing the same job on the pharmaceutical side, we tended to use degrees as much more of gatekeepers. And part of the reason I came out here is, okay, if someone has a bachelor's degree in philosophy, but they're really smart and they want to learn how to do things, like I want them. <laughs> like I don't want to turn them away because they didn't check the right box or they don't have the right background. Um, one of my supervisors, he was a roofer before he came into the field. Um, what you've done isn't that important to the quality of the person. And that, that that's what I like about this job. So the answer is they come from everywhere. They just apply and they impress us at the interview. Awesome. That is I think really helpful to know. I mean, we'll talk more about what they do at the interview that impresses you in, in a couple of questions. Yep. Um, but for all of you students who are listening, um, I think, you know, there is such oftentimes such a misconception that you have to have a degree in a specific field or you have to do X, you have to do Y in order to get in. Um, and you are hearing firsthand that that is not Always the case. Obviously, you're all here. Um, you are receiving degrees in these fields. And so that can assist you, you know, give you maybe a leg up, but really it is going to be, you know, those skills, those characteristics that you have that are able to land and I think keep the job for you. Um, so just wanted to echo that from the career center side of things as well. Um, Kevin, we can come to you for this one now. Of course. So yeah, I believe your first question was um, how do most people get into this field? So for me and the people that I work with, it is right out of college. Uh, we, that, that's who we try and hire. So environmental specialists and environmental chemists, that's, that's who we look for. Um, and that's why I'm here today. That's why I was at the career fair. That's why you know, I'm talking to so many young students that are currently um, you know, ready for graduation in May. And I think my answer also is very similar to Matthew's because, you know, we obviously would love a, a basic chemistry background. We would love a basic safety background, but sometimes that's, that, that's not what students are um, finding that they're interested in or they go on the research side, let's say. So um, we look for specific skills. And honestly, from the, the applicants that I've seen, the people that I know, um, that are on the younger side that I work with. Um, it's, do you have an interest in this field? Do you care about certain things? Do you care about the company goal and the company mission statement? Those go such a long way. And team building, um, self-discipline, those are something that like go so far that a degree can't even cover. So that's, that's really what we focus on. Awesome, thank you. And Gabriella. Um, yeah, I think that this, I think that the field uh, at large of conservation um, historically has catered to a demographic of people who are not from underrepresented uh, communities. And I think that there has been um, a shift in some of the awareness of that in recent years. Um, and I think that that the way that the, the conservation field markets itself to various diverse demographics of all identities, ethnic backgrounds, thought pattern, et cetera, um, it's time for a change. And I think that it's, it's definitely uh, going to open up the door and, and the pathway options for people of different communities to realize that there are several different ways to get into any field. But since we're talking about conservation and public health and environmental related things, there are so many different ways to get into this field. I mean, and that's been made evident just in, in the stories that were shared just now um, on, on today's call. Um, you know, I, for me, my background coming into conservation was very non-traditional. I, I mean, I went to school for, for environmental science and environmental law and policy, but um, I started off 
being just a volunteer at the zoo and just being, uh, you know, around animals and different people and just really learning about habitats and why these things are important. And that kind of just led me to uh, learning all different sides or being involved in different sides of the, the conservation field and, and the legal field. But I also think that um, I needed to experience the entertainment field and the music field a lot more because it opened up my mind to be able to um, to meet other unique people that are creative, um, that can contribute something to the field of conservation as we are looking to looking forward to a new future and looking forward to change. Um, and I also think that when it comes to kind of answering both questions in one, when it comes to figuring out um, how the how the industry markets itself to diverse young people and figuring out like what exactly some of those entry level careers are, you know, I think that it really boils down to or should boil down to a skill set. You know, do you have the skills to get the job done? Um, there are so many people in different fields that got to those positions because of their privilege or because the right connections um, and or whatever their story is. But what we really are looking for, we being ACE, we're looking for people that have uh, a skill set and an interest um, and are open to learning and growing and training and getting training and getting education and getting all of those experiences. Because the truth is that, you know, you can read the job description and, and it definitely is a great indicator of what exactly this position generally will look like. But I think we all can agree as professionals in the field that when you get into the job, sometimes things change and the scope of what your, your role looks like definitely change because life changes, the world changes every single day. So um, I think what, what ACE is really looking for as we continue to evolve in, in our strategy um, and marketing efforts is we want people who have a skill set um, that will cater to the positions and roles um, that we offer. Um, and not only that, but being open to adding to and learning from some of the professionals that we have inside of, of this diverse uh, diverse uh, education um, and skill set background organization and just being able to say, hey, this is my skill set. I'd love to learn more about, you know, chain uh, saw. I don't know. We do a lot of different types of uh, training programs from like chainsaws and all type of wild stuff. But, you know, just being able, again, it boils down to the skill set. Do you have the skill set? Are you open to learning? Um, all of us, are we open to, open to learning and open to growing? Um, and I think that, I think that that is definitely an important aspect of being in any in industry. But again, since we're talking about conservation, I think that's a bit um, and ACE looks for those people with those skill sets who are interested in um, being cultivated into again, our future, our future uh, conservation leaders. Awesome. Uh -oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You pause for a second, but it caught up to itself. So, um, yes, thank you so much for that. So I'm um, just going to add one more thing in from the career kind of perspective, just making sure um, for all of you students who are here today and listening that this is really, you know, hitting home for you. Um, not one of our panelists said you have to have a degree in XYZ field and these specific set of experiences. Um, so I really just want that to, you know, come through for all of you. Um, and on an even broader level, um, we know based on a lot of research that's been done that um, organizations and employers and even grad schools across the board really value what are called um, NACE career readiness competencies. So there's eight career competencies um, and they range from things like equity and inclusion, communication, teamwork, um, career and self-development. So those are things that you can take from one experience from the classroom, from a student organization, from a job and apply it to an organization that you are applying to in the future. Um, and we'll get more into those in a minute. But I do think that that was a really, you know, clear thing that I got from all of your answers is that, um, you know, it's that open openness to learning, that willingness to be at the organization, understand the organization, um, that is really important. Um, so one quick thing to what yeah. you just said, because I, I do think that that's important to definitely hone in on, especially um, when, we're, when we're talking about getting young people involved in the field of conservation and public health, which can sometimes not sound like the most appealing, exciting industry to be in, but it definitely is. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, one, one activity that I really, really love 
doing when I was trying to figure out how exactly can I make a, a career out of this for that makes sense for me um, as a creative person is looking through job descriptions. And as I was reading them, I'll be looking for active words and adjectives that really kind of would help me identify what exactly is the skill set. Because again, a lot of a lot of the job descriptions and PDs that you might see floating around the internet have, you know, there's a lot of fluff that's added um, to the way that things are described. But if you really hone in on what exactly are the action words, that will help give you um, a good idea of what the, the underlying skills that are needed for that position. And from there, you can figure out, do I have these skills? Do I think that I'll be a good fit? Can I transfer any of those skills that I have um, into this position? And if the answer is yes, I say go for it, but don't count yourself out. Um, don't count yourself out. Definitely, you know, add add yourself to the to the mix. I just wanted to add that part. Yeah, absolutely I agree. Yeah, yeah, I'm no, add on that too. Yeah, because um, it is. So I've done a lot of outreach, um, both through professional organizations and through you know personal affiliations. And I'll tell you, it breaks my heart. And I think we're all saying the same thing. So many people act as their own barriers. It's like give it a shot. Like if it sounds like it's something that would be of interest to you, like the worst that can happen is you send a resume or you even have an interview and you're not the good fit and it's not going to work out, you know, for you or them. But like I said, a really quick example is one of the best technicians I've ever trained. And she's actually currently at Pfizer and she's running one of their surgical research groups. I hired her out. She was a baggage claim supervisor, third shift at Logan, but she took a chance. She came in, she did the work. She, you know, listened and learned and contributed. And I have stories galore with her. She was awesome, but it's, she took a chance that a lot of people wouldn't have taken and, and it turned into an entire career for her. So, you know, you got nothing to lose. If it seems like it would be interesting, don't, the advice I always give people across the board is don't be your own gatekeeper. Like, give it a shot. We'll probably, like, again, if you look good, we'll probably at least set you up for an interview and at least you'll get a better understanding of what we do. But you might be surprised that you'll actually get that job and you'll get that career. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, just to continue on with that, um, what I meet, I meet with students one on one. That's part of my job. Um, so for those of you, again, attending, make an appointment with us in the Center for Career Development. We can talk about what these types of things might look like for you as an individual. Um, but one thing that I think is so important is um, kind of this fear of like, I'm not qualified enough, again, being your own gate gatekeeper. You will almost never find a job that you are applying for where every single requirement or qualification or criteria thing that, you know, actionable kind of word um, in that job description that you have experienced before. Like that is unrealistic to expect. And so I think changing your mindset from, you know, there's a couple of things on here that I haven't experienced before. I can't apply to let me connect my passions and my strengths and my skills to that, you know, are identifiable in this to my resume, into my interview um, and go from there. So definitely um, I agree with that completely. Don't, um, don't be your own gatekeeper. And like Gabriella put in the chat, it is true. The worst thing that can happen is that someone says, no, they don't interview you they don't hire you um but you you know you're you're no worse for um that experience absolutely all right so i know um kind of going back to my initial question of how people kind of um enter your organizations and and all of that um i believe that all of you are actively hiring and have positions um available so i i'm just going to give each of you a couple minutes to tell us a little bit more about what those um might look like you know broadly i know um like charles river i think you all have hundreds of openings um so i'm not going to ask you to go through all of them um but generally speaking you know are there any exciting positions that are open um thinking about some of those skills in addition to being open and wanting to learn um anything that you recommend students kind of trying to highlight or that students might connect with um so kevin we can start with you 
Yeah, so um, the environmental specialist role that I talked a little bit about for is, is the bulk of our company. It is the boots on the ground. It is um, those young students getting in the field, getting, getting next to supervisors, um, getting next to researchers. Um, they revolve around day jobs. Um, we, we provide services to clients. Um, plenty of the ones that people have heard of, you know, very popular uh, schools and universities, um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies um, in an in aerospace industry. Um, all of these companies need um, specialists to understand the regulations, understand the field work and understand the safety behind it. And so that's where those that work comes in. So um, some companies require, you know, large amounts of chemical inventorying. Some require large amounts of chemical cleanouts or um, segregation. Um, other types of different laboratory services that's involved. And I think in the the big one that a lot of times people don't understand is we respond to some of these emergencies um, that could either be unknown chemicals. It could be chemicals that are, you know, reacting violently with each other, um, where we have to don and doff the correct PPE um, and the follow the proper procedures behind all those operations. And that is something that is exciting. Uh, definitely. Sometimes it's scary, but there is, you know, that notion of you are not going to, you are never alone. You know, you have management back and you have a company backing you. Um, and that is something that I really enjoyed. And that's something that I grew into the team um, and all the people, the different types of people that I work with and that, that started to spread. You know, I got to meet new people. I got to see other people um, that work in different types of spots in the company that could be operations, business, sales, uh, consulting. So um, that main environmental specialist role is, is what we focus on as far as getting young students into the field, getting them um, accustomed to what the industry is and then training them. Um, Triumvirate focuses heavily on um, training programs and safety programs um, to one, keep you safe, keep other people safe. And then just, just understanding that um, having this skill set, this knowledge is, you know, is very sought after in the industry. So um, that's what we focus on. And that's, you know, I think that's a, that's a good sum of it. Perfect. Thank you for that. Matthew, we'll go to you next. So yeah, Charles River has hundreds of positions as a global company. I mean, currently I have something like 14 or 15 because um, we're just growing and expanding. For new people to the field, I think the two that I have are probably the technician level. So those are the people who are doing the work on study acquiring the data, working to make sure that all of the study experiments are done properly, et cetera. And then a lab assistant role, which is, they're kind of the ones who keep everything moving. So they're the support network for, we're gonna get these put together, we're gonna get these supplies put, we're gonna pre-plan this, we're gonna get these put in. So there's a partnership between those two roles. But like I, said in the earlier piece, like those are the people who are actually doing the work. The rest of us are just there to help them do it. Um, and I would put out there, you know, those are the two roles that you come in, you learn the basics. We have about a six month training program to get, you know, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of regulatory pieces that we need to have. There are a lot of quality pieces that we need to have. Um, sought after, well, people keep poaching my people because they're incredibly sought after. Um, you know, my organization is basically the funnel into pharmaceutical and what have you. And that's partly why I came into it after 20 years on the pharma side. Um, you know, but it's also, it, this might jump ahead a little bit, but it's the opportunity for, you know, in the last two years, micro to macro, we worked on a project. It was done with a great deal of, it was fast. It was a fast paced one, but it was a single individual who had a terminal disease that if we could generate the data, the FDA would allow an emergency use authorization. So the micro is, here's a man that we met. We met his wife, we met his kids, we met his parents. We did it. and 
two years after he should not have been here, he's still here, right? And then the macro piece is I'm 52 years old, the biggest health crisis in my lifetime and probably the biggest one in a century. We probably all saw it in the news and what have you. You know, my team was front and center and had my team and some others within my company not done work quickly, well, high degree of quality, we probably would have seen vaccines delayed anywhere from nine to 14 months. And if you looked at what the fatality rates were, like that's millions of lives saved. And, you know, it's the first time in my entire career that a thing that I worked on is actually in my body. And, you know, so yeah, it's those people who want to come in and making a difference. That's a pretty good difference to make when you're looking in the mirror in the morning. But yeah, so those technician roles, those lab assistant roles, and again, what I think all three of us are saying is we just need people who want to learn and want to do the work. And we've all got the processes and the structure in place. We're not going to get that person with 30 years of experience. We're getting someone who's going to have to have that training. And I think we're all set up to do that. Very helpful. Thank you for that. And Gabriella, coming to you. So ACE is interesting because we have the way that our internship uh, opportunities are set up is we have two different, well, we have a couple of different ones, but the essential ones are two different branches. One is called crew and one is called epic. Our crew programs are going to be more of the um, in the field, hands-on type of work. So that's going to be trail maintenance, wildlife monitoring, um, habitat restoration, things like that. Our epic position um, is going to still have some hands-on aspects of it, but it's going to be a lot more focused and central to a specific role within whatever federal agency is um, partnering with us for to create that internship position. Um, and so some of the some of those positions, we honestly, we have over 100, and I'm not going to sit here and read all of them, but we do have about five unique positions that we're between crew and epic that we really are um, looking to push out there and get more applicants um, to at least check out the position on our website. Um, and two of them are crew, and then we have three different ones that fall underneath the EPIC branch. But um, just kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about the diversity of our programming um, and, and opportunities, one of them um, is uh, it's called the Traditional Trades Advancement Program, and that's one of our subdivisions underneath uh, EPIC. Um, and that position is an Indian Youth Service Corps. So a lot of that position is going to be focused on um, working with sacred lands and working with tribal institutions and local entities that are working really hard to protect um, tribal land. And again, that goes back to education um, also. That's part of that internship experience. But um, we have we have a lot of different opportunities between crew and between EPIC. Uh, just to, to say it one more time, our crew positions are definitely um, require a skill set that they both require similar skill sets. But I would say our crew uh, in, particular, in particular is going to require a skill set where you don't mind being outdoors, you don't mind being in the sun, is real easy to rack up a 10 hour day, you know, working outside. And so we're looking for people that are really dedicated to like being outdoors and lifting heavy things. Um, I got to do a site visit to, to one of our, uh, to one of our crews working in Asheville, North Carolina a couple of weeks ago. And as soon as I got uh, out there, I heard this very loud sound. And when I got up through the woods, where they were, uh, they had, I don't, I really don't know what it's called. So I'm not going to act like I do, but there was this very large machine that would pull down or pull a tree trunk out of the ground in like a couple of seconds. And just so learning how to being open to have a skill set or having a skill set to be open to learning how to use um, tools uh, like that, that, um, that take out tree trunks out of the ground in front of your eye <laughs> is part of what uh, encompasses our crew experience. And then some of our epic, again, positions are more in the field, but definitely getting some of that one-on-one -on -one guidance for our federal partners like NPS, BLM, um, so on and so forth. Um, so the interesting thing though about, um, about our, our positions is if you go to our website, which is usaconservation.org, you're gonna see a tab that says apply here. And that apply here tab is gonna drop down and it's gonna say work with crew, work with Epic, and then it's gonna say staff positions. So if you're out there and you're looking to learn more about some of the positions that I just mentioned or just ACE positions at large, go to our website, usaconservation.org, 
click on apply here, and then it's going to give you the opportunity to learn more about crew, about Epic, about staff positions. And then within that, it'll also give you a very thorough breakdown of uh, some of the federal partners that, that help us with those positions. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and for all of those, all of you who are here, those of you who will be watching this later, um, anyone who's registered, we are going to be sending you an email that has links to the websites, the, you know, postings, um, all of that. So you will get that directly, um, as well as a copy of this recording in the next couple of days. So um, you will have easy access to accessing um, the positions that are open. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So um, I am going to go ahead and do a final question. Um, again, for those of you who are here in the audience today, if you if you have any questions, please ask them. Um, our panelists are here to answer your questions. So feel free to send those over to me via the Q&A box if you do have any. Um, but my final question, I guess, is kind of a, a two-parter, um, but what recommendations do you have for students who are preparing potentially for, you know, a career at your organization or in the field? Um, and then also thinking about when you interview candidates and when you're looking to hire someone, in addition to that, um, you know, openness and willingness to learn, what is one transferable skill that really stands out for you um, in being, you know, appealing in, in someone that you are hiring? Um, and Gabriella, we can start this one with you. The first question was what, say that one more time. Um, what piece of advice or like what recommendations do you have for students um, as they're kind of preparing for a career in, in your case, conservation? You know, I would say I, uh, as a musician, I've always taken a very creative approach to the corporate world um, and jobs, uh, applying for jobs. I honestly, I would say be a well-rounded person. And I wish that somebody would have told me that in the beginning, um, just so I could have been more intentional with how I show that I am a very diverse person and well-rounded and have all of these different interests, but um, do know, uh, have figured out a way for them to align. Um, but I would definitely say that's, I think that's one of the biggest things that will definitely benefit you, um, again, in any industry, but just showing that you bring, um, that you bring a lot to the table and, and it might not look traditional, um, for what that field or what that, that position typically, uh, will require or offer. But I do think that, um, it's beneficial to show that you are a well-rounded person and that you do, um, that you have interest um, that are inside and outside of the field and that you are open to figuring out how to find the intersections between those. Um, and the second part was uh, a transferable skill other than, you know, open list to learning, um, which we've already talked about that just strikes you as being something that you look for in a candidate. The non-traditional answer is value. Um, I think one skill that is very hard, that can be hard for, for humans to learn and to execute is value in the tangible and the intangible things. And I think a healthy balance of the two is definitely something that um, I personally look for when I'm uh, speaking with students or when I'm looking at resumes, um, you know, what, what is it that you value and how do those values align with the mission um, and direction that this organization is going in? Again, your path to the field or your path to whatever job um, or future career you might have may not be exclusive to, you know, a very traditional path of, you know, this is how you get into this field. Um, but again, I think that goes back to showing that you are a well-rounded person, that you are interested in learning and growing more. And in order to do those things effectively and have a sustainable life and career in any industry, I definitely think that having a healthy balance of valuing tangible and intangible things is important. And a very quick um, thing to add to that is the reason why I think that's important is because sometimes you might find opportunities that might um, that might feel like it's the perfect opportunity. You really love everything about it. You interviewed, everything looks great, but then the pay not be what you want it to be. Does that mean that it's a bad position or does that mean that you shouldn't take the position? I think, it, you know, it, obviously it depends on the, it's a case by case scenario, but I do think that a great practice is looking for what value that position offers. And a lot of times positions are gonna give you a tangible and intangible experience that money really can't buy. 
and, and connections that money's not going to be able to buy. So while that internship position might be having you do 40 uh, hours, 40 hours a week uh, for a $150 stipend a week or whatever, um, I think that it's a great opportunity to learn as much as you can. Again, get everything that you possibly can out of that experience, but most importantly, um, make sure that you are, you're growing and learning something from that experience and making connections. Um, and use LinkedIn, use LinkedIn. Definitely echo the, the LinkedIn. I, I echo all of that, but um, LinkedIn is so underutilized. So definitely if you have not made a profile, please do. Um, and we can review that for you. Kevin, we will come to you next. Okay. So um, definitely uh, Triumvirate embodies the safety aspect, you know, the nature of our field. So um, I always recommend students when I, whenever I meet them, either in their sophomore year or their junior year, and sometimes seniors too, um, I recommend they research um, safety certifications. Um, there are some out there that are easy to obtain, and then there's some other, you know, that may cost three, four thousand dollars that sometimes universities like UConn do have a program where you can get your OSHA 40 Haswapper, and that is something that is required for our company, even though our company, after, after you are hired, um, they put you in that in that class, um, that 40 hour class. So that is something that I always say um, it's so important um, and it definitely helps on a resume and the actual skills that you learn from that class are applicable um, immediately. So I recommend that. And then also doing some research if you're not familiar, um, maybe um, with the Chemical Safety Board, um, they have some great YouTube videos. They have a great website. Um, they do investigations. Um, they do all sorts of things with chemical safety. Huge resource. Um, that's that's stuff that I am kind of wrapped in with. Currently, I'm, I'm completing my master's, and that is something they re reference all the time. Um, a lot of the projects that we do do revolve around that. So that's what I recommend. And then as far as um, a standout skill, um, Something that I learned, um, I went to a military school, so I learned followership, and that is transitional from leadership. So everyone knows leadership and could give basic description of leadership, but not too many know about the, the basics of followership, how well you receive orders, how well you um, are within a team of leaders. What can you communicate? How do you communicate? How well you work in that group within your role? So um, I recommend people also research, researching uh, stuff about followership or followship. Um, that's, it's, it's a huge um, knowledge boost, especially if you haven't heard of it. So that's what I would definitely recommend. Awesome, thank you. And then Matthew, we will round it out with you. Fair enough. Um, I mean, the short answer is everything that Gabriella and Kevin just said. But to add to it, beyond the, yes, please, LinkedIn, that's how everyone finds candidates these days. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you are hamstringing yourself. Um, with that said, you know, I'll break it up into before the interview, perhaps, and after. So before, you know, in my field, obviously a background in biology, chemistry, you know, some sort of scientific discipline is helpful. Um, even if it's just on your resume, you're bringing up the classes and the coursework that you engaged in while you were going through something else. But again, having hired and had some fantastic people from all kinds of diverse backgrounds, I would suggest if your background shows experiences that show that you can function on a team, that's huge, right? Because all of us are so interdependent now that we're automatically going to give additional weight to someone It's like, look, they've worked in environments where you have to work with your peers and do well at it. Um, you know, and something as simple as when you send in your resume, have an objective or a cover letter that says, here's why I'm interested in this job, because all of a sudden, you might go from a, I don't see how they're applicable at all to, look, they're honestly interested. Let's give them a shot. Let's at least do a phone interview with them and see if we wanna move forward, if we would be a good fit. Um, and then on the interview piece, you know, besides the take it seriously, you know, that's, that's your first impression. Like from a hiring manager standpoint, I walk into an interview going, you are never going to want 
to show yourself as well as in that situation. So if you come across as disinterested or what have you, I'm not guessing that it's going to get better if we hire you. But if you come in, you know, have, have that ability to go, I know something about this, or if I don't, here are my questions. Please tell me more about this role. Help me understand what's going on. You know, demonstrate that enthusiasm. Have that background of, you know, because if you interview with me, I'm going to ask you, how do you function on a team? Um, you know, and so it sounds kind of silly, but just throwing out there that if you have, for instance, career counseling groups, um, you know, go through the mock interview and see, you know, go to them or go to Google and go, what are the top 10 interview questions? Have an answer prepped for them. Um, you know, but really in this day and age, it comes down to who comes in and portrays themselves in a way that you're like, my team would like to work with them. You know, and, and frankly, that's far more important at these types of positions, I think, than background qualifications, because it's all if I add you to my mix of 40 technicians, are you going to make their life better or worse? And if you come into an interview and it's like, they would be a good fit, they would learn well, I don't care what your background is, we can teach you what you need to learn. It's, they're going to fit well with my team, they're going to look out for each other, great, then I'm giving you a shot. Yeah, I think all three of your answers are so valuable and so insightful um, and are all things that we definitely back in the Center for Career Development. Um, so, you know, you're hearing it from people who are doing hiring, who are looking for people to join their team. So uh, this is, you know, really important to pay attention to and kind of put into practice when you are applying and interviewing for positions. Um, so we are at six o'clock. I want to thank everyone so much for attending and then especially thank our panelists for their time. Um, everything that you have shared today has been incredibly helpful. Um, I have learned a, a lot and I know that our students have as well. Um, like I said, we will be sending an email out to all of you um, who attended today with a link to the recording and then also some additional information on you know some of the postings that each of our panelists have available. Um, but yes, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you panelists for being here. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their Wednesday. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank have you. Fun.